So as okay, so as I said, uh, I'm uh, using a Plab Guide uh, uh, website, uh, and I'm uh, very thankful to Rashid for giving me access to that. So all right, so optic neuritis. Uh, optic neurite, oh, sorry, uh, again, uh, I think, uh, okay, optic neuritis. So what is optic neuritis? Optic neuritis uh, means inflammation of the optic nerve. Okay, so why you are concerned? Uh, you are concerned because usually it is linked with multiple sclerosis. Not always, but in most cases, it will be linked with multiple sclerosis. So typically, the patient will be a female in her 20s or early 30s who comes to you in a GP setting, in most cases, with some headache maybe, unilateral headache, or eye pain, okay, pain in one eye, usually, mm -hmm. along with blurred vision. Okay, the patient may come with loss of color vision as well. So this is very, very typical, all right? Now again, how will you diagnose optic neuritis? Uh, first of all, you need to take a detailed medical history, including history of uh, any, any family history of uh, multiple sclerosis, the other symptoms of multiple sclerosis, for example, feeling of pins and needles in the arms or legs. Okay, this is very important. And any previous episode of optic neuritis, this is very important. I mean, this is very typical. The patient uh, invariably will have history of optic neuritis in the past, in the same eye or in the other eye. All right. So, uh, you need to check with the patient if the patient is diabetic, hypertensive, I mean, all the general uh, medical stuff. Okay, you have to advise the patient to eat healthy, to do regular exercise. Okay. Now, uh, typically the patient will have a decreased vision or loss of color vision. And on, on these basis, you will diagnose optic neuritis. However, you will refer this patient to the eye clinic. Uh, it should be on urgent basis because uh, optic neuritis is usually um, a diagnosis of exclusion. I mean, you have to examine the eye thoroughly before you uh, stick with this diagnosis. And that can only be done by the ophthalmologist. So there might be something else going on in the eye mimicking optic neuritis. So that's why. Uh, my advice will be to refer these patients to the eye uh, clinic on urgent basis. So what will happen with the patient in the eye clinic? The patient will be evaluated fully. And then the ophthalmologist may consider doing an MRI scan of the brain to check for any demyelination. Okay. Whether the patient will have treatment for optic neuritis? In most cases, no. We don't treat optic neuritis because it is a self-resolving condition. Though it can take a few weeks or even a few months for the vision to return back to normal. For the pain, yes, the patient can be provided uh, some analgesia. For example, uh, paracetamol or cocodamol, etc. So this is what uh, you should do anyhow. You, you need to relieve the pain of the patient. And we will take care of her eyes. All right? So the patient, uh, once, once you tell them that uh, you, you possibly have got optic neuritis and this might be linked with multiple sclerosis, then the patient will be very, very concerned about that. She will tell you that, uh, yes, my mom had uh, multiple sclerosis or my sister had uh, multiple sclerosis and she died as a result of that. So you need to provide reassurance that you are not saying that the patient has got multiple sclerosis. The patient has got optic neuritis, okay, which can be a manifestation of multiple sclerosis or can be a manifestation of something else. 
you don't know. Okay, only the ophthalmologist will be able to tell you. Moreover, if it is multiple sclerosis, then treatment can be done. Things have evolved in the last few years. We have new treatment modalities available now, even for advanced cases of multiple sclerosis. All right, so provide a bit of reassurance to the patient that if this is multiple sclerosis, then uh, treatment can be done. And the treatment is uh, very successful now. All right. Uh, Rashid, do you have any uh, particular questions related to this uh, scenario? <clears throat> um, no, my, my question is uh, the, the only advice that I want um, to, to, uh, to know for myself I think I have the understanding, but uh, most of the candidates, uh, what they should be doing in case, uh, in terms of the advice to the patient um, uh, for driving, do they need to involve the DVLA? Are they allowed to drive? Okay. Uh, no. oh, because yes. this is very, a yes, very important, very important question. Uh, I should have discussed that in uh, cases of uh, glaucoma. Uh, okay, so legally you can drive an ordinary car with one good eye, okay? Which means that you don't need to inform DVLA if you have got neuritis in one eye, for example, okay? There's no harm informing them, but you don't need to. You need to inform DVLA about glaucoma though, okay? If you have been labeled with glaucoma, only then you need to inform DVLA. And uh, the uh, only DVLA will decide if, if you are okay to drive or not. Yes, the patient may ask you that, doctor, will I be able to drive or will DVLA let me drive? So you don't have the answer, okay? Just tell them that you are not an expert of this condition. So you don't know. Only DVLA, even the ophthalmologist cannot decide if the patient is okay to drive. Only DVLA has the authority to decide if the patient can drive. So the, the need to inform DVLA. DVLA will ask one of the opticians of their area to evaluate this patient with some special eye tests and send them, send, uh, them the report. Only then DVLA will decide if they are okay to drive. Why do we have to declare that for glaucoma and not optic neuritis? Because optic neuritis affects one eye only in most cases and glaucoma will affect both eyes in most cases. And as I said, for driving, legally you are okay to drive if you have got only one eye. Okay. Uh, Samra has raised her hand. Um, so Samra, yeah, what do you want to ask? Uh, yeah, actually, I have a question. It's a bit of confusion for glaucoma. You said that if a patient is able to have glaucoma in one eye, no need to inform the DVLA, but you also told that we need to inform the DVLA no, on no. glaucoma. No, 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 this is not what I said. Sorry, okay. Uh, I, I said glaucoma is a bilateral condition. Okay. Okay. Always. Yes. Okay. So they need to inform DVLA. It is on their mm -hmm. website that if you have got glaucoma, you have to declare that to DVLA. Mm -hmm. Optic neuritis, 95% mm -hmm. cases will be unilateral. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I said legally, you need mm -hmm. only one good eye to drive, which mm -hmm. means that you don't need to declare optic neuritis to DVLA mm -hmm. if it is affecting one eye only. Mm -hmm. Am I clear or not? Yes, yes. But mm -hmm. if it is glaucoma, yeah. even, even if glaucoma yeah. is in the one, one eye, you have to tell no, the DVLA. That's, that's what I'm saying. Glaucoma uh -huh. is always bilateral. Okay, but if the patient so, comes with symptoms in one eye... Symptoms in one eye, it doesn't mean that the patient does not have glaucoma in the other eye. The mm -hmm. other eye has got glaucoma but the patient is not experiencing any symptoms. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. This is what I'm saying. Uh, I, I'm, I'm saying. All right. For mm-hmm. glaucoma, you need to declare that to DBLA. For uh, optic neuritis, you don't need to. But there is no harm. Okay. Mm-hmm. For diabetic retinopathy, you don't need to declare that to DVLA unless you are having treatment in the form of injections or laser. All right. Okay. Going to the next uh, scenario. Again, one of my favorite one, cataract. Okay. Uh, so, uh, just to summarize, what is cataract? How will you explain that to the patient? This is what the patient is going to ask you. Okay. So, typically, you will be in a GP setting. Patient will be referred to you by the optician again because of cataract. This is what we'll say on the referral. The patient has got cataract. Okay. So, first of all, you need to inform, uh, you, you need to educate patient that what is cataract. Cataract means cloudiness of the lens in the eye. Mainly or uh, mostly due to increasing age. However, the cataract can develop due to some other conditions as, as well. For example, high myopia. For example, steroid intake. For example, diabetes. For example, trauma. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, as you're talking, there is a there is a scenario that comes. Um, a patient um, is on steroids uh, for uh, PMR, polymyalgia rheumatica, and now she is coming with the uh, reduced vision. So this is uh, one of the common scenario, I think. Yes. Uh, yes. I, I was I, I was about to discuss that as well. Yes. So as Rashid pointed out, this is a very common scenario now uh, as well that patient has got polymyalgia rheumatica and has come to you with decreased vision. So most people think that the patient has got giant cell arthritis and they start talking about giant cell arthritis. Okay. And that, then they get confused that the patient uh, does not have any symptoms of giant cell arthritis apart from decreased vision. But they keep on talking about giant cell arthritis. No, please remember, this is cataract. The patient is on steroids. Sometimes they, may, they mention that uh, in the scenario, but in most cases, they won't. Though, they will tell you that the patient has got polymyalgia rheumatica. So, you have to check with the patient if the patient is taking any steroids or was she taking any steroids in the past. All right? Only then, you will uh, be able to... Uh, Kamran, is there any point of one single question can tell us that this is a cataract but not the optic neuritis? Is anything, any particular question that you would want to, uh, to optic ask? Optic neuritis from, or from... giant cell arthritis? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. GCA, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. To yeah. compare GCA and uh, because this is what the candidates get confused yeah. about. Yes. Yeah. So in GCA, I mean, GCA comes with the very typical scenario that the patient has come with loss of vision in one eye, when I say loss of vision, it means loss of vision. Okay. You can't see anything along with a unilateral headache and temporal tenderness. And For is the... that okay? Is that sudden onset or it can be sudden, very... acute, acute? Okay. okay. The patient will typically come to A and E. He won't All come right. to GP setting. All right. This is very. And the symptoms are constant, persistent, not intermittent symptoms. Well, uh, the patient can have, uh, can, I mean, there might be history of intermittent symptoms as well. That the, uh, I, well, I had some problem. Uh, I, I had blurred vision, uh, lasted for, uh, let's say, a few hours, and then it improved. But uh, this morning, um, I have lost all, all of my vision. But giant cell arthritis will be typically unilateral. Okay. Cataracts, on the other hand, will be bilateral. 
Okay. There won't be any headaches with the cataracts. There won't be any nausea and vomiting. There won't be any temporal tenderness. Okay. So on the history, again, stick to the basics. Good detailed medical history, including history of any uh, medications, diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol. You can ask about myopia as well because that is linked with the cataract. You can ask about any previous eye surgery that is linked with the cataract. Okay. Uh, you can ask about any trauma to the eye or to the head because head trauma or ocular trauma can cause cataract. All right. For the cataract, again, uh, what will happen? Well, uh, what will happen to me, doctor? Well, uh, sir, I will refer you to the eye clinic on a routine basis for further treatment. So, what treatment will I have in the eye clinic? Well, possibly they will remove the cataract from the eyes. It is approximately 20 minutes procedure done under local anesthesia. Now, these are very important words. Please remember. Done, usually done under local anesthesia with the help of ultrasound machine. Don't say that it will be treated with laser machine. No. Cataract surgery is done uh, with fake emulsification, which, which is a kind of ultrasound machine. All right? And it's a 20 minutes job, usually, for one eye. Usually, we do one eye at a time. After the surgery, there won't be any hospital stay in most cases. The patient will go home straight away. He will be given some eye drops for three to four weeks. So once one eye has settled, the other eye will be done. Let's say after a few weeks. Okay, Dr. Kamran, this, this is another uh, scenario where the patient has been asked to see the, to see the optician, uh, sorry, ophthalmologist. Uh, because uh, the patient cannot see and uh, she is presumably um, suffering from bilateral cataract. So does okay. that does that rule apply in this? Because, because the GP has advised not to drive. Uh, does that apply in this rule, the one eye and both eye vision problem? No, uh, again, for cataract, uh, okay. Now, uh, DVLA is very clear uh, about cataracts. Yeah. Okay. That they don't need to be declared hmm. because this is a treatable cause. Okay. All right. Glaucoma, glaucoma gives you blind spots, and these blind spots are permanent. All right. Okay. Okay. Similarly, stroke gives you hemianopia, yeah. and that is usually permanent. So okay. these conditions need to be declared to DVLA. But cataract, no, there is a clear guidance on their website that if you have got cataract, don't waste our time. All right. Okay. So do you us. mean? Uh, I'm sorry. Do you mean that uh, advising no to drive is mainly for the safety reason? No, uh, no, no. Just tell the patient that if you are not feeling confident, don't drive until yeah. your cataracts are removed. All right. So there is no legal obligation for that. No. No. Okay. okay. Exactly. Thank you. All right. So uh, again, what other advice will you give? To the patient, well, ask them to eat healthy, do regular exercise, blood pressure should be controlled, diabetes should be controlled, okay, cholesterol should be controlled, etc. That's hmm. it, right? Okay. okay. So stick with the basics again. Okay. Don't discuss cataract in detail with the patient. They are not interested in knowing about the cataract. They are interested in knowing your approach to any patient in a GP setting, which can be cataract, which can be glaucoma, which can be diabetic retinopathy. So focus more on uh, medical uh, history rather than ocular history. Yes, ask few questions quickly related to the eye problems as well, because that will help you to ascertain whether this patient needs uh, a quick referral or a routine referral. For hmm. example, if the patient has got advanced cataract, she is living alone, she is falling down because she can't see anything because of the cataract, then I think I will refer the patient urgently. 
All right. So this is uh, we, we don't want the patient to uh, fall down uh, that night and uh, fracture her hip, for example. All right. Yeah, this is a situation that we are seeing nowadays that the patient is uh, living alone, severe, uh, severe impairment of uh, bilateral vision. Vision. So do you suggest that referring this patient on that ground will be reasonable as oh, an yes. ophthalmologist? Yes. Yes. yes, yes. So whenever you are in doubt, the rule of thumb is that you should refer the patient urgently. That's it. Okay. okay? Whenever you are in doubt, refer the patient urgently. It is not, they are not going to direct any marks for doing that. All right? Okay. However, it is a good practice to know uh, that in few cases, you don't need urgent referral. Hmm. The patient can wait because there's a lot of burden on NHS. You can't yes, yes, everyone yes. same day. We won't be able to accommodate everyone. Hmm. All right? So we don't need any legal issues later that the patient was referred the same day, but she was not seen for three days or five days or for a, for a month, for example. Mm -hmm. And then she, she is suing the eye department. So this is what you, you need to consider as well. All right. All right. So, um, uh, just let me check the uh, uh, Sorry, in closed, will it affect both or just one eye? Uh, Mariam has asked. I think uh, she's uh, talking about uh, angle closure glaucoma. Well, usually angle closure glaucoma will be unilateral. However, she will have some symptoms of angle closure in the other eye as well. So that's why uh, the treatment will be done in both eyes. Ask of what, please? I didn't uh, get that. Sorry, I didn't ask. Uh, sorry, I didn't uh, get that question either. Uh, it is from uh, iPhone. Mm. Uh, do we send her to a &E? You are talking about angle closure glaucoma. They will come to a and &E. They won't go to the GPs. Okay. And why they come to the a &E? Because of unilateral headache, severe, uh, along with nausea and vomiting, and decreased Sorry. vision, seeing halos around light. Sorry for interrupting. Mm -hmm. Doctor. I was asking about optic neuritis. The patient, you said it's going to be urgent referral. When you said urgent, do you mean like same day or uh, within two Optic neuritis. Uh, did I say urgent referral? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I said urgent referral because uh, you think that this is optic neuritis, but you are not sure, isn't it? So it might be something else. Mimicking optic neuritis. And it can only be uh, diagnosed by the ophthalmologist. For example, the patient may have got severe uveitis that can mimic optic neuritis. All right. So what will you do? You will refer uh, this patient uh, on urgent basis. So any headache, any pain, any Sorry. acute Sorry. decreased vision? Sorry. Sorry, same question only, sir. Urgent referral, you have told like. Urgent referral means in two weeks or on the day immediate immediate referral on the same day. It all depends. Okay. I mean, uh, okay, I'm 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 coming to that. Uh, okay, uh, Doctor Kamran, okay. actually, I'm sorry for interruption. What they want yeah. is a clear definition of what you mean by urgent, because yes. there are there are three different types of referrals that which yes. are being used. I'm, 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 I was uh, about to uh, talk about that. So, as a rule of thumb. Any acute decreased vision, any uh, unilateral severe acute headache, or any acute eye pain, okay, needs to be referred same day. All right. Now, someone has asked, can trauma lead to optic neuritis? No. Trauma does not cause optic neuritis. Uh, someone said camera off. Uh, well, I have, uh, yeah, I have off the camera because I'm sharing the screen. Uh, can you see the screen or not? Um, we can, we can see just a part of that, and um, it is not synchronous to what we are talking about at the moment. We can see that cataract slide at the moment. Yes, a cataract. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so no, I'm, I'm on the same slide. That's fine. Uh, okay. So as I said, as a rule of thumb, 
if the patient has got acute decreased vision in one eye or in both eyes, or if the patient presents with the severe acute headache with nausea and vomiting, or if the patient comes with acute pain in the eye or around the eye, the patient needs to be referred in these situations on the same day to the ophthalmologist. All right. Okay. Do we normally so, have uh, 24 hour services? So, um, there will be someone on call for ophthalmology in every hospital. All right. I know that we send the patient to MRI. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, because uh, your hospital, uh, well, it's not part of UK anyhow. But, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, well, they are different, but uh, no, they have, uh, yeah, uh, uh, they have got arrangements with the Manchester Royal Eye Hospital that uh, all the emergency cases will be referred to Manchester Royal Eye Hospital. So, yeah. there will be some sort of arrangement, anyhow, for 24 hours cover. Okay. Uh, okay, coming to the next scenario age related macular degeneration. Right, so let me check what the scenario have you put for age-related macular degeneration. So you are in foundation year two working in ophthalmology. Okay, in ophthalmology. Hmm, interesting. Who the patient is? Uh, okay, 68 years old with visual problem. Talk to the patient, assess her and address her concerns. Um, okay, um, Rashid, uh, do you mind asking uh, this scenario? I mean, yep. was this scenario asked uh, as such? Um, honestly, difficult for me to, to confirm that because the scenarios were they were created about two years ago, and we keep. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I think uh, the typical scenario, yeah. the the typical scenario that I came across uh, in the past for age-related macular degeneration was that the patient has been referred to the GP by the optician because of age-related macular degeneration all right okay so the diagnosis so nowadays, we are seeing the diabetic retinopathy is being referred by optometrist to the gp yes yeah. yes just similar to that yeah okay so the patient will typically come to the to to gp setting not to any okay if you click on this on this um uh, button you know the icon at the bottom it may show us the background information uh, history of presenting complaint. Yeah. Well, very nice. Okay. Yeah. So history of presenting complaint. Yeah. So, okay. Perfect. Yeah. So there is a lot of information there. Good. Good stuff. Okay. Yeah. So uh, first of all, what is uh, macular degeneration? Uh, how will you, I mean, you, you all know what is macular degeneration, but how will you explain that to the patient? This is very important. Okay, you can't uh, uh, give them a, a lot of medical jargon uh, because they, they will get confused. So what is macular degeneration? To my patients, uh, I, I tell them that macular degeneration means increasing age changes at the back of the eyes. Okay, which means that changes those you develop in your eyes due to increasing age. Now, age-related macular degeneration can be of two different kinds. One is dry age-related macular degeneration, which is common. There is no treatment for it, unfortunately. However, the patient retains very useful vision, even in advanced cases or end-stage cases. Okay, so I'm not sure if uh, uh, people who are attending, uh, they want to write it down. This is uh, where most of the candidates will, will struggle, that how to differentiate dry macular degeneration from wet age-related macular degeneration. So you need to tell the patient that dry macular degeneration is very common. Unfortunately, it is irreversible and not curable. However, the good news is that the patients retain useful vision 
even in advanced or end stage cases. Okay. On the other hand, <clears throat> wet macular degeneration. Wet macular degeneration has treatment. I mean, it can be treated, it can be cured, but uh, so it is relatively uncommon as compared to dry age-related macular degeneration, but it is severe as compared to dry macular degeneration, which means that if you don't treat it on time, then someone can lose all the vision in the affected eye. All right. Okay. Um, so, is it usually unilateral or bilateral? Yes. Uh, okay. The patient will usually come with bilateral symptoms. All right. Okay. Usually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Especially in dry age related macular degeneration. Okay. The patient will tell you that I'm struggling to see. Mm. Okay. Just like cataract. All right. It will be not be acute in onset. I mean, I'm talking about, now. I'm talking about dry age related macular degeneration first. Okay, oh. forget about the wet age related macular degeneration. Focus on dry age related macular degeneration first. Yeah, dry age related macular degeneration, chronic in nature, slowly progressive, painless, and bilateral. Bilateral, just like cataract. Yeah. Okay. okay. And how how can we? I'm sorry for interruption again. How can we differentiate between? Uh, dry um, age related and, degeneration in the cataract then and the cataract yes very well question no you can't differentiate that yourself mm -hmm. it Sorry. will be in in the instructions mm -hmm. that the patient has been referred by yeah. the operation because okay. of dry age related macular degeneration mm -hmm. number one this can be one scenario okay or they can show you some photos okay okay and mm -hmm. tell you that, well, this is what patient has got. So oh. let me show you the photos. Thank you very much, uh, Rashid, for sharing the photos. Yes, the first photo. Okay. Can you all see that? Yes, so we can. This is, the retina. this is the macula. On the macula, you can see these drusens, yellow drusens. Okay. So yeah. these, this is dry age-related macular degeneration. All right. So in advanced cases, you may see a lot of more drusens or some um, areas of atrophy. Okay. okay. So this is dry age-related macular degeneration. So th they may give the photo instead of uh, the diagnosis. Hmm. Okay. okay. All right. So there won't be any hemorrhages. Please remember, if you can see a bleed, it is not dry age-related macular degeneration. It okay, will there be. be any patchy loss of the vision? Or... Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Okay. Now, in advanced cases, the patient may tell you that uh, I can't, uh, I mean, uh, my vision is poor, but with one eye or with the with both eyes, I uh, the, the, there is a patchy loss of vision. If I'm okay. looking at, at a certain thing, the mm -hmm. periphery of that thing is clear. But okay. the center is missing. Okay. Okay. So okay. the patient will have a scotoma in the vision. All right. So in one eye or in both eyes. Okay. So um, this can be a question to ask if we want to differentiate from the other conditions like cataract. Uh, well, the, as I said, this will happen in advanced age-related macular degeneration only, mm -hmm. not right. in um, early or intermediate okay. age-related okay. macular degeneration. Okay. Right. Uh, so, uh, and as, as I said, uh, there will be a diagnosis for you. Okay. It, it, I, I, I won't be able to justify if the GMC, uh, 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 gives you this scenario without giving you a previous diagnosis. I mean, you, you can't, uh, diagnose age macular degeneration in a GP setting yourself. The oh, yes, I think uh, I think this is uh, something that the candidates get concerned about unnecessarily. 
Yeah. Uh, I do not think that um, not being able to diagnose or being able to diagnose will be considered as a parameter of uh, passing or failing. What we want to see as an examiner, if I do that in the mocks and when I do the assessment, and you uh, you must have also done that, we see the patient safety, the patient-centered approach, and the approach, um, the clinical approach of the doctor, and not necessarily mean that doctor should be able to diagnose, and we do not yes. expect them to. Well, I you, well, even they're, they're, sorry, yeah. yeah, please carry on. Yeah, even I cannot really diagnose such cases uh, without the help of uh, of a senior specialist. Um, I think. Uh, what we can do is, if we are concerned, just send the patient to the specialist. That's why they are specialists. And we sure. are not. Yeah. So, moreover, uh, well, yes, there are a few things. Those you should be able to diagnose uh, because uh, of uh, nature of urgency. For example, yeah. myocardial infarction. You should be able to diagnose that straight away. Yeah. Yeah. The symbolism, you should be able to diagnose that straight away. Yeah. Giant cell arthritis, to some extent, yes, you should be able to diagnose that. Uh, angle closure glaucoma from the eye. Yes, you should be able to diagnose that. All right. But yeah. if you are not sure if the patient has got cataract or patient has got dry age latent macular degeneration, it doesn't matter. Even if you, uh, if the patient has got, let's say, dry age latent macular degeneration and on the history, uh, you didn't uh, uh, take a uh, detailed history and you thought that the patient has got cataract and uh, you start talking about cataract, it doesn't matter. Honestly, they are, they are not going to penalize you uh, for that. However, they want, I mean, whenever uh, I say they, it means GMC. They want to make sure that you are a safe doctor. So you have got the safety netting and uh, you, you take a detailed history, uh, especially related to past medical uh, health. All right. So this is very important. Okay. So coming back to age little macular degeneration. So I was talking about dry age little macular degeneration. So what advice will you give to the patient? Now, this is very, very important. Please remember, healthy diet for any health condition is extremely important. But at the top of the list, it is dry age little macular degeneration. So in dry age little macular degeneration, you need to eat healthy. You need to. You don't have a choice. Okay? You may have got a choice of uh, uh, you, of your food for something else. I don't know. Maybe for appendicitis. Okay? But for dry age, little macular degeneration, you don't have a choice. It is your... You are duty-bound to eat healthy now. Otherwise, if you don't eat healthy, the dry age, little macular degeneration will get worse. And you will eventually go legally blind. I'm saying legally blind, which is something different from blindness. Oh. Okay? So please remember that. Initially, I said that dry age little macular degeneration does not make you blind. You retain useful vision, even in advanced cases. Okay? Uh, but that blindness is something different from legal blindness. Legal blindness has got a different criteria. So don't confuse these terms, please. Right? Okay. What else can you do for age-related macular degeneration? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, okay, Samra, let me uh, finish this uh, age dry age-related macular degeneration first, and then I will uh, um, answer your question. Uh, what else will you do for dry age related macular degeneration? Eat healthy. You can uh, try some vitamin supplements. Those are available over the counter. Okay, this is very important. The vitamin supplements are helpful for dry age related macular degeneration. What vitamin supplements? The pharmacist will tell you. Okay, you don't need to answer that. Just tell them that I'm. Uh, you just talk to the pharmacist, your pharmacy, your chemist. They will be able to give you something for dry age, little macular degeneration. But you cannot prescribe those supplements. 
because they are supplements, they are not uh, medications, right? So you need to buy those, right? What else can you do? Well, uh, there are multiple societies, for example, Macular Society. You can register with them and they can help you, okay? What else can you do? Well, you can give some leaflets, tell them about uh, websites. And then if you want to get 12 marks from this scenario, then you can tell the patient that uh, the ophthalmologist or the eye clinic will refer you to low vision aid clinic. If you tell them about low vision aid clinic, no one can stop you from getting 12 marks out of 12 from this particular scenario. So what is low vision aid clinic? Well, they are just uh, some uh, clinics in the community run by opticians most of the times where they give you, dispense you some special sort of glasses, some magnifiers, some audio books, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So low vision aid clinic. It's a nice word to remember if you can. All right. And depending on the level of, of damage to your vision because of dry age-related macular degeneration, you may be entitled to get registered as partial sighted person or as a blind person. So there are two categories of blindness, legal blindness. One is partial sightedness, one is severe sightedness. Okay, or severe uh, loss of vision or blindness, all right? So only the ophthalmologist will be able to tell the patient that if they are eligible for either of these categories. So what will happen if the patient is registered as partial sighted uh, or as a, as a blind person? They can get a lot of support in this country from social services, from local council, Okay, from everywhere, really. All right. So, but it is the job of the ophthalmologist to decide. In most cases, yes, we will register patient as partial sighted or as, as blind if they have got uh, age-related macular degeneration, either dry or wet. Okay, sorry, Samra, you raised your hand. What did, what do you want to ask? Uh, I wanted to ask about what do you what do you mean by legal blindness? What were you think you're saying? I did not understand that point. Yes, uh, legal blindness uh, is the criteria. Uh, uh, I mean, if someone uh, fulfills that criteria, then they are uh, registered as as uh, blind. Though in reality, they are not completely blind. What does that mean? Hmm. They're not completely blind, but they are registered as blind. Yes, yes. So what, what is blindness? What do you think? Not what is blindness? Either partially, it could be like you just said, it does either partial blindness or complete blindness, not able to see. No, 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 not, not complete blindness. No, no. Okay, for, uh, for example, if the patient has got six by six vision in both eyes, mm -hmm. but... He had a stroke, mm -hmm. and because of the stroke, he has got hemianopia. Mm -hmm. Do you think the patient has got perfect uh, eyes? No. Do you think the patient has got partial sightedness? Probably, yes. No. This patient is legally blind. What right. Does that mean? Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So this falls into legal blindness. <laughs> All right. So it is, uh, in fact, uh, the le the level of support that someone needs. All right. So based on uh, uh based on your decision, if the patient is uh complete blind or partial sighted or normal, they will get the support. All right. If someone has got hemianopia, should they be allowed to drive? You think? No. 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 They should not be. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So how will they cope with their routine activities then? They live on their own. Okay, they can't drive. What will they do if they want to go to Tesco, which is five miles from their house, to buy grocery? What should they do? They can take the bus. They can take the bus. There's public transport available. Uh, okay, yeah. So they take the bus and they pay ten pounds uh, for the bus on a round journey. Uh, but they don't have money. What should they, they do? I don't know. You don't know. Yes, that's the answer. So it is where the state comes into action. If you register them as uh, blind, hmm. a state can um, provide them bus pass, free of mm -hmm. cost, mm -hmm. all right? If they struggle to go to the bus, uh, for example, if they struggle to go by bus, they can provide uh, some sort of uh, transport free of cost, all right? So this is for the state, really. Uh, so depending on the category, the level of help will increase. From the state all right so that's what i mean legal blindness which is different from your understanding or my understanding of blindness all right okay all right okay. so uh Another Drew, thing, just one more thing yeah. you told about the low vision aid clinic and you told that they are clinic run by opticians and you know they provide with some glasses visual aid and some health self-help books right well, there are multiple other uh, things available at low visionary clinics. Yes. Okay. Okay. Special okay. lamps, for example, large special, uh, lamp. special lamps, large TVs, large size TVs. Okay. Uh, some special softwares, for example, for their computers, uh, where there will be someone uh, doing a running commentary if they can't uh, see things, texts. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's. There is a full range of uh, different products. Hmm. Okay. Now, someone asked, uh, can visual vertigo be classified as legal blindness? No. Vertigo has nothing to do with the blindness. Okay. Hmm. Trusen seen in dry age related macular degeneration. I'm not sure if this is a question uh, or an answer. Yes, drusens are uh, typical of dry age related macular degeneration in early cases. Uh, now, sorry, doctor, I joined late. How do we differentiate dry and wet or on fundoscopy as foundation year two? Okay, I haven't talked about uh, wet age related macular degeneration, so I will answer that in a minute. Low vision aid clinic, yes. Uh, did you say low vision aid clinic? Yes, I said low vision. Can you please turn camera on? Uh, I think people are missing my presence. I think I should stop sharing uh, my screen so that you can have all you have. I mean, you can all have the pleasure of seeing me live can you see me now no sorry can you see me or not i yes, can see can. You. i could see you yeah you can see okay yeah all right so let's uh, move to the next uh, scenario and that is a wet age related macular degeneration in the beginning as i said wet age related macular degeneration is usually acute or subacute all right either there will be sudden loss of vision sudden decreased vision or decreased vision going on for the last few days it doesn't run for months or years all right uh there will be a working diagnosis for you typically the you will see the patient in a gp setting referred by the optician because of wet age related macular degeneration there will be diagnosis on the on the referral i think it, it's very harsh really uh for someone in a gp setting to be asked to diagnose wet age related macular degeneration based on the history alone okay no gmc is not going to do that they will give you a working diagnosis so, uh, someone asked if, uh, uh, how will we differentiate uh, dry age related macular degeneration from the uh, wet age related macular degeneration based on fundoscopy? No, usually you are not able to diagnose uh, these conditions on, on uh, fundoscopy alone. 
Okay. Yes, sometime in wet age related macular degeneration, you get a, a, a macular hemorrhage. That can help okay. you uh, in differentiating these two conditions. But usually you need to run a lot of eye tests, including optical coherence uh, tomography. You don't need to remember this word or fundus fluorescein angiogram to differentiate these two conditions. Right? Uh, so why can't I see myself? Uh, your uh, screen uh, is my screen still shared? Uh, Rashid, sorry, can can you tell me if I'm uh, visible to you yes, guys? Yes, you, you you are visible, Doctor Kamran, uh, but we cannot see this shared screen. If you want, um, um, yeah, I, I know that. Yeah, yeah, I know that. No, I, I'm just checking. Okay, so oh. I'm sharing the screen again. So do you want me to share the screen for you? I can run that if you want. I can change the screen. No, no, that's fine. I'm 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 uh, on the on the I'm I'm sharing the screen now. So yes, yes, please. Uh share the screen, please. Uh okay. So uh how is uh wet age related macular degeneration from dry age related macular degeneration? As I said, uh wet age related macular degeneration is usually acute in onset or subacute in onset. Usually bilateral, though not always. Okay. The patient will come to you with the decreased vision going on for the last uh, few days, maybe, or since this morning in one eye or in both eyes. Usually there will be a working diagnosis uh, of wet age related macular degeneration sent by the optician. Okay. So what will you do? Okay. Now for dry age related macular degeneration, before I forget, uh, you need to inform DDLA, okay, because it's a chronic irreversible condition, so you need to inform DDLA. And you will refer this patient to the eye clinic on a routine basis, not urgently, okay. But again, it all depends. If the patient is struggling a lot, having falls, for example, because he's not able to see, then you can refer the patient to the eye specialist on the same day as well. Though we are not going to do anything, but just for your own uh, uh, sake, you, you can refer the patient straight away. But usually it is a routine referral, right? Uh, for dry age lateral macular degeneration. However, for the wet macular degeneration, you need to refer the patient on an urgent basis, preferably on the same day. Why is that? It is because wet age related macular degeneration is fairly aggressive. However, there is treatment available as well. All right. So, uh, because of these factors, you need to refer the patient straight away to the eye clinic. And then only the ophthalmologist will decide if the patient needs treatment or not. In most cases, yes, the patient will need treatment in the form of Injections in the eyes, monthly injections or one injection every two months for a few years. And the results are very promising of these injections. All right. But again, you have to advise patient about healthy lifestyle, healthy eating, regular exercise, vitamin supplements. Okay. Low vision aid clinic. Again, the patient uh, well, ophthalmologist uh, can refer the patient to low vision aid clinic for help. And uh, uh, then, uh, uh, depending on the level of damage to the vision, the patient can be considered for registration as a partial sighted person or as a blind person for some support. Okay. And don't forget to mention about various societies those can help for example macular society and the leaflets and uh, information websites don't forget about that All right um okay sorry um 
Uh, okay. Uh, is it all right if uh, we all take a 10 minutes break? Rashid? Yeah, yes, why not? Okay. So I will join. I, I mean, uh, you can just, uh, I'm, I'm going to mute myself and stop the video. I will join you back in uh, 10 minutes precisely. Um, okay, so I will pause. Uh, I'll pause the meeting, and so that yeah, pause the recording, and then we will start again after ten minutes. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Rashid. Uh, okay, so let's uh, move to the next scenario, and that is ophthalmia nunatorum. So uh, first of all, what is ophthalmia nunatorum? Uh, conjunctivitis in first few days of uh, your your life uh, is uh, what we call as ophthalmia neonatorum. What can be the causes of ophthalmia neonatorum? It can be a chlamydial infection, it can be gonococcal infection, or it can be any other infection really. Okay, but these two, the first two, uh, chlamydial and uh, gonococcal, they are the most notorious ones, and you need to know uh, well about these infections. Now, these infections uh, affect uh, the eyes of the newborn during delivery. So the source of infection is the mother herself. All right. So please remember uh, that this is a systemic disease. This is not just ordinary conjunctivitis. If they have got, if the ch child has got uh, symptoms in the eyes, then they need to be evaluated fully to check if there is any other systemic involvement. And when, when you are treating uh, the child, you need to treat the source as well, which will be mother in this case. All right. You may have to treat uh, the partner of uh, mother as well, depending on uh, if there is any infection uh, carrying by the partner. All right. So you need to do screening of uh, uh, parents. All right. So now, how uh, the the typically the patient will be only a few days old, three four days old, ten days old, or fifteen days old, with the uh, redness in both eyes, along with a sticky discharge coming out of the eyes. All right. So you have to take a detailed history. Uh, from the mom about her health. Okay. Uh, so you have to take history from the mom and uh, about herself. You have to take history from mom about her partner. You have to take history uh, of the child from mom as well. All right. So the treatment, treatment of ophthalmia neonatorum Usually, uh, uh, you, you need to ask uh, in detail about the mode of delivery. I mean, was that carried out uh, by a trained uh, person in in a in a, in a uh, sort of good uh, uh, delivery unit, or was it done at home by someone who was not trained? All right. So, what precautions? were taken during the delivery, were aseptic measures uh, followed during delivery or not, all right? And uh, then was there any prophylactic uh, treatment uh, done at the time of delivery uh, for ophthalmia neonatorum uh, to prevent ophthalmia neonatorum or not? Uh, then you need to take uh, conjunctival swabs, okay? And you need to tell the mother that the results, uh, well, based on the results, the child will have treatment, which can be just uh, local treatment to the eyes, or it can be systemic treatment, depending on the results of the swab. Okay. But most important thing is to take uh, a de detailed history from the mother of herself, including any previous infections and then trace the partners as well, in case there are multiple partners. 
So this is very important. So as far as the child is concerned, please remember that this is not a, 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 an ordinary conjunctivitis that you are dealing with. This is a systemic condition. If child has got gonococcal conjunctivitis, for example, then there's a possibility that the child may be suffering from uh, gonococcal infection in his body. So you may have to treat the child. You may need to admit the child. Okay. So typically, uh, it will be in a GP setting. Okay. So you need to talk to the pediatrician, not to the ophthalmologist. You need to talk to the pediatrician same day. And then the pediatrician will decide if the child needs to be admitted or not. But at your end, you will request the baseline investigations, including conjunctival swabs. All right. So uh, this is all about uh, ophthalmia neonatorum. Then uh, another scenario, subconjunctival hemorrhage. Well, um, I'm not sure, uh, honestly, if they are asking this scenario anymore. But anyhow, uh, PLAB Guide has compiled a list of ophthalmology scenarios. Uh, so, and they have uh, included subconjunctival hemorrhage. So I assume that it was asked uh, recently. And that's why uh, they have put that on the list. So uh, no 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 this is mainly this is mainly for them to be aware of and for the sake of uh, practice uh, this oh, is oh, part of oh, the that, that that makes sense okay yeah it is now coming uh, very often it is a part of the foundation course where we work more on the on the history taking and uh, in the approaches perfect thank you very much for the clarification yeah so subject travel hemorrhage uh, typically it will be painless unilateral uh the patient will come to the GP setting that doctor, well, I have got uh, redness in the eye since this morning when I woke up, I found that my eye was red. I'm not having any problem whatsoever. Okay. If the patient has got pain, then this is not subconjunctival hemorrhage. This is something else. If the patient has got decreased vision, then this is not subconjunctival hemorrhage. This is something else. So, okay. So all you have to do is to take again, detailed history, medical history of the patient, especially History uh, related to uh, hypertension, uh, diabetes, hypercholesteremia. Okay. And then any uh, trauma to the eye. Okay. You may ask about any blood thinners, for example, aspirin or warfarin as well, or any clopidogrel, because they can occasionally cause uh, subconjunctival hemorrhage as well. All right, warfarin is a is a, a very well known cause of uh, subconjunctival hemorrhage. So, in case the patient is taking warfarin, we need to check. Uh, we need to request for INR just to make sure that it is not excessively high. And if it is, then we have to adjust the dose of warfarin accordingly. All right. Uh, some rare conditions, uh, for example, uh, leukemias, etc., or some uh, blood disorders some clotting disorders uh, not linked with the drugs uh, can cause uh, subconjunctival hemorrhage as well. So if you can't find anything else on the history, then you can uh, request some routine blood tests just to make sure that uh, the patient does not have any uh, clotting disorder, for example, any leukemia or lymphoma sort of thing. All right. So, but uh, the patient does not need treatment for the eye itself. You have to reassure the patient that nothing is doing because subconjunctival hemorrhage, uh, as, a, as a rule of thumb, is self-resolving condition, though it can take a few weeks for this condition to settle down completely. All right. So we usually don't request any blood tests, uh, really, even if you can't find anything on the history unless the patient comes with a recurrent subconjunctival hemorrhage. Mm. All right. Only then we request uh, some blood tests to rule out any underlying uh, rare systemic uh, disorders, uh, including leukemias, lymphomas, etc. Uh, I think Samra wants to ask uh, something. She raised her hand. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kamran. 
Uh, I think yes. this is subconjunctival hemorrhage is quite common in in the cough as well or the COPD patients. Uh, not COPD. Well, well uh, yes, I agree that uh, with coughing, you can get subconjunctival hemorrhage as well. So yeah, you can ask about. Uh, I mean, that that will be part of uh, general medical history. Yeah. And so if, this is just a so, yeah. So if the patient has got cough, uh, yeah, you know what to do. So, uh, sorry, Samra, do you want to ask anything? Yes, uh, actually, I just had a question. I'm sorry, I joined a bit late. Altha, ophthalmia and neonatorum, so what history related? I'm very sorry to take you back. Can you please just tell me quickly what history related questions would you ask? Yes. So, as I said, uh, in ophthalmia and neonatorum, you need to take history of the mother. You need to take the history of the child. And you need to take the history of the partner or partners from the mother. All right, so you you will be working around three history uh, scenarios at the same time. All right, so especially the mother's history is most important. All right, related uh, to the child, ophthalmia neonatorum, as I said, uh, is uh, usually not um, a local eye condition. It is a manifestation of a systemic condition. All right, so there might be something else. Uh, I mean, if the patient, if the child has got a, a uh, conjunctivitis because of gonococcal infection, then there is a l high possibility that uh, the child may have encountered a gon a gonococcal infection in his body as well. So that's why the treatment will be, uh, I mean, it will not be uh, just topical treatment. The child may need admission and IV antibiotics, but it all depends on the results of the swab. Okay, so you need to take uh, conjunctival swabs uh, uh, for uh, the bug causing of Thelmia neonatorum. And the further management uh, will be decided on the results of the swab. Okay, on the history, you it is very important to check uh, about the delivery itself. I mean, was the child delivered in a, in a hospital in, uh, in, 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 uh, under the care of uh, professionals? Or was it just a home delivery? Or was it delivered in any sort of clinic with unprofessional, uh, untrained people? So this is extremely important. All right. If uh, the child has got any other siblings, uh, if he has, then did they have this problem uh, when they were born? So that is uh, telling you, uh, that is pointing uh, out that the mother has got uh, the infection. And that's why all the kids are getting this infection. So we need to treat the mother now. Okay. Similarly, even if you treat the mother, uh, but you don't treat her partner, then the mother may get the infection again. So you need to treat the partner as well. All right. Uh, but it all depends on the results of the swab and on, on the results of your history. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's move to the next uh, one, and that is uh, retinal detachment. Okay. So uh, retinal detachment. Uh, uh, I'm I'm not sure how frequently are they asking uh, about retinal detachment. Uh, usually, I mean. Uh, uh, Plab Guide Academy, they have uh, put a scenario. Uh, uh, yes, this is uh, this is quite common. Uh, this is okay. uh, uh, one of the hot topics. Yeah, yeah. So now it says that you are foundation year two in the GP setting, uh, and the patient uh, has come to you, sixty years old, uh, with complaint of loss of vision in one of eye. Okay. Um, usually, these patients uh, they go to A and E. Usually. Okay, um, but sometimes they can come to the GPs as well. But you need to bear that in mind that retinal detachment uh, can uh, go to A&E as well. Usually they go to A&E, in fact, okay, in, in most cases. Okay, so there will be sudden loss of vision in one eye, not bilateral. If it is bilateral, think of something else. Okay. So there will be the patient will typically tell you that they saw a curtain coming across the vision, and that curtain 
um, after a few minutes or after a few hours, uh, spread all over. So they can't see anything. There won't be any pain in the eye. Okay. On further questioning, the patient will tell you that he or she had some flashing lights or floaters or both a few days ago or a few hours ago. Okay. So again, you need to take uh, general medical history. First of all, you particularly need to ask about uh, diabetes, uh, cholesterol, high blood pressure, because diabetes is linked with the uh, increased incidence of retinal detachment. Okay. And any other systemic uh, conditions uh, sometimes can, can cause the retinal detachment. Then if you want to secure 12 marks out of it, you should ask about uh, myopia, history of myopia, okay, or history of use of, use of glasses all their life, and history of trauma, and history of previous surgery, because they, these are all risk factors for retinal detachment. So any previous eye surgery, I mean, I'm not talking about lids, I'm talking about intraocular surgery, for example, cataract surgery. Okay, or history of, uh, let's say, uh, intravitreal uh, injections in the past. Uh, then history of trauma and history of myopia. If you ask about these three uh, uh, factors, uh, I mean, these are all uh, uh, predisposition uh, factors for retinal detachment, then they are bound to give you 12 marks. Okay, so... Uh, after taking the detailed history, uh, just make sure that you educate them about uh, the importance of uh, healthy uh, lifestyle, including exercise, healthy diet, etc. And if it is acute in onset, which is usually the case, then you need to refer this patient to uh, ophthalmologist same day. So what will happen? Once they go to the ophthalmologist, uh, well, they will have the surgery done of the eye to reattach the retina. So how will you explain this to the patient that they, has, uh, they, they have uh, retinal detachment? Uh, so you will tell them that the retina is the back layer of the eye and it is attached uh, to, 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 to the back. Uh, okay. But due to one reason or another, this layer has separated. Okay. And that's why they are not able to see. So they this layer needs to be reattached at the back with the help of surgery. All right. So as I said, uh, the symptoms are usually suggestive of retinal detachment. The typical symptoms will be uh, flashes and floaters followed by seeing a curtain in the vision not associated with any pain and then losing the vision altogether in a matter of few hours or a couple of days. Always unilateral. Please remember. All right. History of myopia, trauma and previous eye surgery if you want to get 12 marks out of 12. Very important. Any questions about retinal detachment? Yes. One more uh, thing. Uh, don't forget, uh, retinal detachment is usually, uh, I mean, patient will be in his 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, usually not young. But this is not a rule. But in most cases, it will be an old patient. Okay. Any questions about uh, retinal detachment? Attachment. Uh, someone said, I heard of some intravitreal injections too. Is that so? Intravitreal injections too. Uh, about what? About retinal detachment. If you're talking about a retinal detachment, uh, the treatment, well, intravitreal injections can cause retinal detachment. Yes. Intravitreal injections can cure retinal detachment. Yes. Okay, but they are rarely needed for retinal detachment. The cure is usually with the surgery. But sometimes we do intravitreal uh, gas bubble as well 
if it is a, a small retinal detachment. All right. Should we mention mention what? Sorry, Hira, uh, can you um, uh, say that on the mic? I, I don't get that question. Uh, so, yes, I said myopia, oh, sure. previous surgery, and trauma. That is the risk factor for retinal detachment. Yes, Hira, sorry, you were saying something. Uh, yeah, I was asking, uh, that somebody told me that we can mention the intravitreal injections as well as a cure of uh, retinal detachment. So I'm asking, can we mention that as one of the... Uh, no, 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 no. You don't need to give uh, false hopes uh, to the patients. I mean, they rarely used uh, intravitreal injections for the cure of retinal detachment. Okay, if the patient has got, oh. if the patient has lost vision, then it is not going to be amendable with intravitreal injections. Okay, so once the once you refer uh, this patient to me, for example, and if you tell them that well, uh, the injections uh, can be done, then the patient will start arguing with me that why am I suggesting surgery, uh, and why am I not not doing the injection straight away? So you need to be careful. So uh, all we're going to do is uh, refer the patient to the yes. uh, specialist yeah. and tell... The... Yeah. And tell okay. the patient that the patient uh, will have a surgery. Okay. All right. Okay. Anything else from retinal detachment? Mm. I have a, I have another question. Uh, you were saying something about healthy lifestyle. Uh, I missed that point. Uh, are we going to tell about the healthy lifestyle choices in retinal detachment after we mentioned it's the surgery? Everything, everything. Okay. okay. Um, healthy lifestyle does not have anything to do with retinal detachment. However, uh, in GMC, you will only get marks if you mention healthy lifestyle. All right irrespective of the scenario all right thank you and this is this is not just for, for the ophthalmology this is for everything patient with appendicitis you have to inform them that they need to adopt healthy lifestyle though they didn't get appendicitis because of unhealthy lifestyle but this is what the gmc is evaluating you for all right okay uh Idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So that's a fairly new scenario, but an extremely common one in clinical practice. I mean, um, I see idiopathic intracranial hypertension, three or four patients out of uh, uh, 12 on my list every day. Okay. So what is idiopathic intracranial hypertension? How will you explain that to the patient? It means high pressure in the brain. Okay, causing swelling of the nerves of the eyes. I mean, you are explaining papilledema basically because of a raised intracranial pressure. All right. So this is how you will explain uh, to the patient that I am suspecting that you have got a condition that we call as idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which means high pressure in the brain causing some swelling at the back of the eyes. Because it is causing swelling of the back of the eyes or uh, swelling of the nerves of the eyes, that's why it needs treatment. If the optic discs are left swollen for a long time, then uh, it will start damaging the optic nerve fibers, which means that your vision can get worse with time. All right? So typically, idiopathic intracranial hypertension patient will be obese ladies, okay, in their 20s or 30s, okay. So they will come uh, with the complaint of headaches, chronic headache, for the last maybe few years or few months, associated with blurred vision and this blurring of vision can be constant or intermittent though blurring of vision is not usually the presenting complaint the presenting complaint is usually 
long standing headaches okay may be associated with nausea and vomiting all right sometime well in fact in clinical scenario in most cases the patients are referred by the optician to us because the gps uh, they send uh, the patients uh, to opticians to check if they need glasses and if they are getting the headaches because they are not using the glasses but they then the opticians uh, find that a uh, patient has got papilledema okay so they refer uh, the patient uh, to you, to 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 the ophthalmologist or back to the gps in few cases right so in idiopathic intracranial hypertension what are you going to do? First of all, you need to take detailed history. Okay, including history of diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol. Healthy lifestyle is extremely important in idiopathic intracranial hypertension. These patients are usually overweight and it is the gain in their weight, any recent gain in their weight that can uh, catalyze the headaches okay and the papilledema so uh, the headaches usually uh, they you, you are able to differentiate these headaches from the other causes of headaches for example most of the times these headaches they follow uh, a diurnal variation I mean to say that they change with the time of the day. They are usually worse in the morning than the afternoon or in the evening, okay? Moreover, uh, they get worse if they bend uh, their heads down or if they lean forward, okay? Sometimes there might be associated nausea and vomiting. Usually these headaches are generalized. They are not unilateral. Okay, so you need to rule out the other causes of uh, uh, headaches, anyhow, the serious ones especially. For example, subarachnoid hemorrhage, though it is subarachnoid hemorrhage is extremely uncommon in this age group, but you still need to rule that out. Then giant cell arthritis, again, it is highly unlikely uh, to present in this age group, but you still need to rule that out on history. Okay, then meningitis, for example, you need to rule that out. Okay, uh, cerebral venous thrombosis and the other causes of headaches, you need to rule that out. Okay, so uh, one aggravating factor for idiopathic intracranial hypertension is the use of oral contraceptive pills. This is very important, if you can remember that. People, I mean, ladies who, who use oral contraceptive pills, the incidence of uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension is more in people who use oral contraceptive pills. So you need to check with the patient if the patient is using any oral contraceptive pills or not. All right. Now, uh, what will you do? Well, this patient, yes, you can refer the patient to the eye clinic just to check for papilledema. The ophthalmologist does not treat idiopathic intracranial hypertension. We only give our findings that the patient has got papilledema. Okay, and then it's up to the neurologist or uh, a physician or internal medicine specialist to uh, decide what sort of treatment is needed. All right. So before the treatment, usually the patient will have uh, an MRI scan of the brain to rule out any space occupying lesion. Why is that? The, the diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension is based on opening pressure of uh, CSF on lumbar puncture, all right? But before the lumbar puncture can be done, we need to do 
an MRI scan of the brain. Uh, because there's always a possibility that if the patient has got spatial coma inclusion, then it can cause these sort of headaches. It can cause raised intracranial pressure as well. But if you attempt a lumbar puncture in these patients, there is a possibility that there might be herniation uh, of, of the uh, brain tissue in the spinal cord. All right. So that's why the MRI scan is done to rule out any space of lesion. Once the space of lesion is ruled out, then lumbar puncture can be done. But it will be decided by the internal medicine uh, consultant, not by you. Okay. Your job is to educate the patient about healthy lifestyle, healthy eating. You need to insist uh, that if you try to redu reduce your weight even slightly, there might be dramatic effect on your headaches. Okay, you may suggest a referral uh, to uh, a dietitian as well if you want to get get twelve marks out of twelve. All right, but it's all about healthy lifestyle. Nothing more than that. Okay. Any questions from idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Let me check the messages. This, did you say retina is the battery of the eye? This, did you say retina is the battery of the eye? No, no. I didn't say it's the battery of the eye. I said uh, retina is the back layer of the eye. Okay. So if it gets separated from the rest of the eye, then this is what we call as uh, retinal detachment. Uh, if it's idiopathic, would, would that be because there is no evidence of trauma as a source of it? Trauma? Hmm. Never thought about it, really. Um, idiopathic intracranial hypertension means that you have excluded all the other causes of raised intracranial pressure. What are the other causes? Cerebral venous thrombosis, meningitis, space of lesion, etc. Only then you will label them uh, as idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And that's the reason you are doing, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you're doing uh, uh, an MRI scan of the brain, right? Uh, given that most of the symptoms are the same to the symptoms of trauma induced, ocular motor nerve palsy would not be necessary to rule out too. Uh, sorry, uh, someone asked uh, me a question. It says uh, CF backup. I don't know. Uh, sorry, that's not a name. That's a mobile name, I think. Given that most of the symptoms are the same to the symptoms of trauma. Sorry, can you please unmute your mic and ask that question? I didn't get that question at all. Now, can you briefly repeat the management of intracranial hypertension? Yes. As I said, it's about healthy lifestyle. Okay, so advice about healthy lifestyle. Uh, check with the patient if uh, the patient is uh, taking any oral contraceptive pills. Ask them to stop the oral contraceptive pills for the time being. That may help. Uh, then uh, referral to the ophthalmologist uh, to rule out papilledema. Uh, then uh, the ophthalmologist may suggest uh, an MRI scan of the brain. And then the patient will be referred to a medical specialist. Uh, uh, for possibility of lumbar puncture or slash further management. Uh, uh, you have to treat uh, the headache though with some painkillers. So uh, what examination we are going to do in retinal detachment? Well, uh, you, 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 you do uh, ophthalmoscopy. Um, however, uh, the retinal detachment is extremely difficult to be picked on of thelmoscopy. Why is that? It's because of thelmoscopy uh, gives you a two-dimensional image only. And retinal detachment, unfortunately, is a three-dimensional uh, condition. So unless you use both eyes to see the retina simultaneously, 
you you are usually not able to pick up if this is retinal detachment or something else. However, you can offer ophthalmoscopy, though you are not going to pick that up uh, uh, if you do that. Uh, uh, said, uh, so because sometimes upper cervical instabilities induce cerebral fluid uh, leaks disorder may be the source of intracranial hypotension. Uh, implications affecting the eyes, if not tilted out, I'm Catherine. Okay. Uh, well, Catherine, uh, sorry. Um, well, I, I think we are, we are uh, uh, talking in a different dimension now. Uh, um, sorry. Uh, well, your, your question is very, very valid. But uh, uh, GMC is just... Uh, trying to uh, make sure that you are safe at foundation year two level. They are not expecting you to discuss the differential uh, diagnosis of rare conditions, for example, cervical instabilities, et cetera. So if you get a patient who is young female in her early 20s, sorry, in her 20s or 30s, who is overweight and she has got headaches, stick with Diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. No, no, Catherine, you are absolutely fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, shall we move to the next scenario? Yeah. Okay. Now, I think I will do this one first, which is blephritis. Um... Uh, I was at the Plab Guide Academy the other day and they were discussing uh, about something uh, related to eye. So I was there for something else. And when I heard, uh, I found that um, they had a blephritis scenario that day. However, uh, most of the candidates, unfortunately, they did not have any sort of uh, information about, about blephritis. Some of them, uh, thought that it was allergic conjunctivitis. Uh, some of them uh, thought of uh, other conditions. Uh, however, it was a blephritis uh, scenario. So, typical scenario. Okay. Uh, the patient will come to the, the general practitioner, uh, so, uh, so, sorry, to the, to the GP. Okay. Uh, Middle-aged ma man uh, or a lady, or an old uh, lady or a man uh, coming to the GP because of itching, irritation, uh, along with a bit of swelling of the eyelids or redness of the eyelids for the last few weeks. This is very typical, okay? And uh, the patient uh, may tell you that, uh, well, I've been using dry eye drops. They help to some extent, but not a lot. What shall I do? So again, uh, take detailed history, past medical history, including history of uh, any eye problem before. Okay. And uh, then uh, take history about any uh, skin conditions. This is very important. Blephritis in, in significant number of cases is associated with some skin conditions. For example, eczema, for example, acne uh, vulgaris, for example, acne rosacea. Because if the patient has got some general uh, skin condition, then they will need treatment for the skin condition as well, in addition to blephritis. Okay, so first of all, the patient will ask you, doctor, what's wrong with my eyes? Sir, you have got blephritis. Doctor, never heard of it. What is blephritis? Sir, blephritis means that your lid glands, I mean the glands in your eyelids, they are infected. So doctor, where did I get this infection from? No, sir, you haven't uh, got this infection from anywhere else. These bacteria or these bugs, they live in those glands. However, due to some reason, 
the number of these bugs or these bacteria have increased and that's why you are having problems. Okay, so what can I do? Again, going back to the basics, eat healthy, do regular exercise, okay? Use some lubricating eye drops, do some lid hygiene. Doctor, how can I do a lid hygiene? I'm going to give you a leaflet, sir, and it will explain all about lid hygiene. Okay, so you have to clean your eyes regularly, really. Okay, if this works, fine. If this does not work, then I will refer you to the eye specialist to check if you need any specific treatment. For example, some antibiotic tablets or topical antibiotics or some steroid drops. Okay, but you need to uh, do this uh, before you consider referral uh, to the ophthalmologist. All right? Don't just refer the patient to the ophthalmologic clinic. Do it yourself. Uh, educate them about healthy lifestyle. Educate them about lid hygiene. Ask them to use some lubricating eye drops. You don't need to prescribe lubricating eye drops. They are available over the counter. All right? So you don't need a prescription for those. So use the eye drops regularly for a few days or let's say for a couple of weeks. Do lid hygiene if the symptoms do not improve. Okay, yeah, then refer the patient to the uh, ophthalmology. Okay, on a routine basis. So what will be the symptoms? As uh, mentioned uh, in the scenario, typical symptoms will be irritation in the eyes, itching in the eyes, redness of the lid margins, occasional uh, conjunctival redness as well, okay, going on for the last few weeks, few months, or even few years, okay. The patient may tell you that uh, it gets worse uh, during, uh, let's say, summer, but it, I feel better in winter. Again, don't confuse that with the allergic conjunctivitis. Allergic conjunctivitis can present, uh, can, can, have, can have a seasonal variation as well, uh, but blephritis, uh, can have a seasonal variation as well. So how will you distinguish or uh, this, this condition from allergic conjunctivitis? It is the lid margin swelling, okay? Redness of the lid margin or redness of the lids. If the lids are red, then most likely this is blephritis, not conjunctivitis. If the lids are not red, then most likely this is allergic conjunctivitis, not blephritis. So this is important, right? Uh, How is it, is it recurrent? Um, sorry, uh, Dr. Kamran. Is it a recurrent condition? It is always recurrent. Right. Chronic. Okay. No. Is it Chronic. a disease that um, in association like uh, in eczema or? That's what I said. That you you have to check if the patient has got any skin conditions. For mm -hmm. example, eczema, okay. uh, acne rosacea, uh, acne vulgaris. These are very, uh, I mean, these conditions invariably can cause blepharitis. So oh. if you can find any skin condition, then you have to treat that skin condition as well, in addition to blepharitis. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Any more questions from uh, um, blepharitis? All right, okay. Uh, let me see, uh, how do we ask about both kind of acne? No, you just uh, check with them. Uh, if you have got any skin conditions, they will say yes or no, okay. Uh, no doctor, I don't have uh, any skin condition. Okay, uh, do you uh, get, uh, do you suffer from acne? Okay, so you don't need to ask about uh, acne vulgaris or acne rosacea. Yeah. Just ask them about uh, acne, right? All right. Okay, now uh, the next one. Uh, well, in fact, uh, before this one, I will do keratitis. Okay. Uh, 
So the next one is keratitis, acute bacterial keratitis. Okay, so this is the other name of corneal ulcer. Please remember, all right? So it's the corneal ulcer or acute bacterial keratitis. You can use uh, whatever term suits you. Uh, Dr. Kamran, I'm sorry yeah. for interruption. Can I request you to actually, uh, I've done them so many times, but I want you to provide the feedback, if possible, if we can get someone to practice and do that, um, maybe, and um, you give sure. the feedback. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, do one scenario. Okay. Can I have a volunteer, please? Uh, me, iPhone. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, iPhone. Okay, yes. Please, uh, please write your exam date. Uh, we'll pick the closest one. Yes. Write your exam date, and uh, that, that that's the thing. Uh, April twenty third, May tenth. Okay. So, okay. Mm, uh, can I have the exam date for the iPhone, please? April, April middle week. iPhone April middle week. Yes, uh, congratulations, you are selected. <laughs> so uh, yeah, all right. So can you please uh, unmute your mic now, and uh, if it is possible for you to uh, okay, sorry, let me stop sharing uh, the screen for the time being. Uh, can you see me? Yeah. Yes, I can see. You can see me. Perfect. Okay, so doctor, I can't see you. Sorry. Mm. Um, well, if it is possible for you to turn the camera on. Um, if it's okay without the camera, I would do okay. that. That's, that. That's all right. That's absolutely fine. Okay, okay doctor. You. So, Samra, you have raised your hand. Uh, uh, I will uh, talk to you uh, after once we have uh, done this one. Okay. So, uh, I'm Mr. Smith, I'm 76 years old, uh, and you are in a GP setting, foundation year two doctor. I have got some concerns. Mm -hmm. And okay. uh, you have got uh, six minutes to resolve everything, really. Okay, not eight. All right? Uh, we can okay. use the timer in that. Uh, and, um... mm, well, uh, in that case, I have to... Turn that. Uh, I mean, I have to share the screen, which I don't want to really. Uh, uh, but I'm, I'm just uh, checking the time. Okay, your time starts now. Hello. Good morning. Oh, hi, doctor. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Sony. I'm a doctor here in this department. Can I please confirm your full name and age? Hello, doctor. Yes, uh, you can call me John. Uh, my name is John Smith, and I'm sixty. Uh, sorry, seventy-six years of age. Okay, nice, nice to meet you, John. Uh, so how are you doing so far? Doctor, I'm very much concerned. I'm going to go blind, I think. Uh, uh, that's okay. I'm here to address your concerns, John. Okay, could you please just tell me that why do you think you would be blind? Doctor, I went to, to the optician this morning uh, because I thought I, mm -hmm. I need some glasses for reading. And uh, he said, uh, John, uh, you have got... Uh, changes uh, due to diabetes in your eyes uh, so um, I, I think i'm going to lose my vision now and i live alone so i'm i'm concerned that who is going to look after me i'm so sorry that you are so worried and concerned john but uh, let me assure you we are here for your help and support okay so we'll definitely just uh, look what's going on okay and we will make some options for you is that okay yeah, yeah, sure, please, doctor. Go so, on. well, coming to your diabetes, John, could you just tell me how long you have been diabetic? Doctor, I'm diabetic for the last 20 years. Okay, and how are you managing that? Uh, doctor, uh, I've been prescribed uh, some medications, uh, but mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm, I should admit that I have not been very uh, keen with the medications. Okay, that's all right, John. We'll uh, we'll uh, work on that. What about uh, are you? Uh, is it under control your diabetes? No, doctor. That's what I'm saying. I mean, the the medications uh, those I was given. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. They give me headaches, so that's why I don't like uh, those tablets. 
Okay, that's all right. So what uh, the symptoms regarding your eyes you're having at this moment? Uh, doctor, I, I felt that my I, I was having some problem with my reading. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm struggling to read newspaper. I'm okay with okay. my driving. I mean, I can see clearly uh, at distance, but reading was bothering me. So that's why I went to the optician this morning and he said, uh, John, uh, you have got uh, diabetic retinopathy or something. So Okay, you did a great yeah. okay, you did a great thing going to optician John. But it's just similar how long you have been noticing these changes, the uh, this uh, near vision uh, defect. Well, uh, uh, I think I would say 35, 40 years now. Uh my my I, I use reading glasses, but for the last three or four years I think uh, it is getting worse. So that's why I okay. for uh, okay. yeah, for new glasses. Anything today. that makes it better, John? Glasses, they help, yes. Okay, okay, right. And it's been a long time, like uh, almost 40 years. And since four years, it's been very worse. So how is it affecting your daily activities and everything? Hey, doctor, I'm, I'm, I'm okay at the moment. I mean, um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm struggling just a bit to read the uh, newspaper, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm managing all right. Okay, that's fine. Well, I would like to ask you a few further questions to just see what's happening, okay? Mm -hmm. Is that all right? Yeah, please, Doctor. John, could you tell me that? Do you see that uh, objects look smaller than usual before? Like they are in the actual size? No. Okay, do you see that the straight lines seem wavy sometimes? No. No, okay. And any kind of curtain falling uh, in front of your eyes sometimes? No. No, okay. And uh, <clears throat> what about uh, any... Uh, blah, uh, any spots uh, around your vision? No, doctor. Okay, that's all right. And could you just tell me that any pain or discharge coming from your eyes or any kind of watery thing? No. No? By any chance you had any trauma to your eyes? No. Okay, any, any foreign body that you might have noticed? No. Okay, do you use contact lenses, John? No. Okay, any fever-like symptoms recently or flu-like symptoms? No. Five minutes okay, after. That, okay, that's all right. Well, uh, John, could you just tell me that other than diabetes, are you diagnosed with any, any other medical condition? Yes, I have got high blood pressure. Okay, since how long? 40 years. Okay, okay. And is it under control? I didn't check that for a long okay, time. That's all right. And anyone in the family have related eye problems, John? No. Okay, okay. And what do you do for a living? I'm retired. That's all right. And is this all affecting your mood, John? Yes, I'm depressed now. I'm going to lose okay. my vision. Okay, okay. Your, con uh, your, your concern is valid, John. Uh, okay, could you just tell me that, uh, do you have any idea what might be causing all this? Diabetes. Diabetes, yeah, definitely you must. You are right. Diabetes can get the vision worse. Okay, six minutes up. So for but carry on. okay, uh, for the while being, you know, I would like to examine you. Okay, check your vitals, and do some of the examination of your eyes, and I will also do exam. I will examine your back of the eyes as well. All right. Okay, your time is over now, but carry on, carry on. Okay, yeah. Okay, and uh, I will send some of the initial investigations, like your full blood count and some of the inflammatory markers as well. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, any findings? Uh, patient has got high HbA1c. Blood pressure is 180 over uh, 100. Uh, cholesterol is uh, 5.8. Hmm. Okay. Well, John, thank you so much for all this information. So you, uh, you know, from all the assessment that you have told to me and everything that we have discussed, uh, you are right that it could be it could be something related to your diabetes, some kind of diabetic retinopathy. Have you ever heard about it before? Yes, doctor. I, I heard that uh, many people go blind because of diabetes. Uh, yes, uh, uh, this is right. Uh, this is the case with some people. But the thing is that uh, the ultimate goal is to uh, control your diabetes at this level. So we have to work on that for now. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, diabetes is a long-term condition and it can uh, involve your small blood vessels, your large blood vessels as well. 
and it mm-hmm. can uh, make the vision wor- more worse with the time right and for now i would like to like to refer you to the eye specialist okay they will do some more investigations and more uh, assessment of your eyes and um uh, uh, according to that they will uh, provide you some of the treatment options okay like there could be some kind of laser therapy or uh, depending on the situation uh, they are in a, in a better place to explain all the things okay john i will okay. provide you the leaflets okay uh, regarding your diabetes control uh, and i can also refer to dietitian so that you can have a better diet control and everything and i will also make a review for your diabetic specialist so that you can mm-hmm. take your medications uh, co- with compliance would that work for you john okay doctor okay. will well, i thank you so- uh yeah john your concern is valid but uh, you know as i told you that we have to control your diabetes as already the damage has been made it can't be it can't get reverse but of course we can prevent the further damage of your eyes so you think i'm understandable to you yes yeah, yeah, so you think, so doctor you are saying that my vision is uh, bad because of uh, diabetes yeah well uh, for the uh, while i'm suspecting this but of course specialist is the in a better position to address all the things that you're having Thank in your mind thank you very much doctor all right okay uh, uh sorry can you see me still no no yeah 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 you can okay all right uh, thank you very much doctor thanks for the help okay uh, first of all uh, no no my symptoms are not linked with diabetes at all i said uh, that i'm using glasses for reading for the last 35 years and mm-hmm. it is getting worse so i have got presbyopia it has nothing to do with diabetes no it's not cataract it is presbyopia everyone gets presbyopia once they are 40 years of age everyone will need reading glasses and these reading glasses will become thicker and thicker as you grow older so this has nothing to do uh with diabetes this has nothing to do with the cataract this has nothing to do with age related macular degeneration all right this is just presbyopia i said uh in the history that i can see clearly at the distance all right so which means that the diabetic retinopathy is not causing any problems at the moment this is important okay okay and whenever you are taking history uh i mean uh, the eye history forget how the vision is for the near it's the matter uh i mean it is the vision at the distance that matters All right everyone will need reading glasses after certain age it doesn't mean that their eyes are not healthy okay so uh i'm not sure at what time you joined uh, this uh, discussion uh, uh however i discussed that in detail uh, i mean this was the first scenario i think uh when we started the uh, discussion today and i said uh, that forget about the eye for the time being you have to check if uh the diabetes is well controlled if the blood pressure is well controlled if the cholesterol is well controlled controlled now i said to you at the beginning that i'm not sure if my diet is my diabetes is controlled why is that it's because i'm not taking medications why am i not taking medication because the tablets are they they give me headaches so you should have asked more about that that what tablet are you on or at least you 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 need to discuss that uh, once you are discussing the management with me that if you are getting headache because of the tablet it can be side effect of one of the tablets okay so if you are getting headache because of the tablet and that's why you are not taking the tablet then we can consider changing the tablets we can give you some alternative tablets but the most important thing is to keep an eye on your blood sugar level it needs to be very well controlled your blood pressure needs to be well, very well controlled your cholesterol needs to be very well controlled you didn't ask about smoking smoking is linked okay the diabetic retinopathy i mean it was just an incidental finding by the optician yes you need to refer me 
to the ophthalmology department to check if anything needs doing about the diabetic retinopathy. But it is not the diabetic retinopathy that is affecting my vision at the moment. It is just presbyopia, which has nothing to do with the diabetes. All right. Healthy lifestyle is what you have to focus most on. Am I doing any regular exercise or not? Am I eating healthy? Okay. So just keep revolving along these, uh, around these questions. You took a long time, really, uh, for the history about the eye itself. I said very clearly when we started the conversation that I don't have any problem with my eyes apart from reading problem. You asked about uh, if uh, I'm seeing any distortion or any wavy lines or some things are appearing bigger, something smaller, uh, any flashing lights, any floaters, any trauma. I said clearly to you right at the beginning that I don't have any problem with the eyes apart from reading problem. So the reason why I said that was uh, so, so that you can focus more on the general medical history rather than on the eye history. But still, you sp spent, I was uh, timing you, you spent approximately five minutes for unnecessary questions. Those did not give you any information and they did not have any marks either. All right. So please, 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 for all of you, please remember that this assessment by GMC is to check you if you are a safe doctor at foundation year two level. Okay. The only purpose of you in the hospital is to educate the patients. I'm working as a consultant. I don't have time to spend 30 minutes with the patient giving them information about various leaflets, for example, about healthy lifestyle. Okay? Yeah, if you want me to treat a retinal, uh, let's say, detachment or diabetic retinopathy, I'm happy to do that straight away. But I understand the importance of healthy lifestyle good diabetic, uh, diabetic control, good mm -hmm. hypertension control. But I don't have the time to discuss that with the patient, myself. That's why I have hired you, a foundation year two doctor, to save my time and to save your time as well and to save patient's time as well. You should be discussing these aspects with the patient don't worry about diabetic retinopathy. I'm here to help. I will take care of that. But I can't take care of his diabetes. I can't take care. I mean, I don't have time really to discuss that with the patient. Okay. So please remember that. Once I said, I don't have any problem with my eyes. Don't waste your time asking me unnecessary questions. That do you have flashing lights? No. Floaters? No. Any micropsia, macropsia? No. Any wavy lines? No. Any headaches? No. Don't have any problem. I'm driving perfectly well. I can see clearly at the distance. Okay? So, please remember, only focus or focus more on general medical history rather than the eye history itself. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Dr. Kamran said. Um, what I feel is that there is a huge confusion among the candidates on um, on the scoring system. They think that only the only way to, to get the marks for data gathering is by taking long history. So I've done that experiment so many times with the candidates. Uh, even if you give them the results to explain before they start talking about the results to explain, which are very obvious, say, for example, anemia, 
they would start taking the history uh, about your diet, about your, okay, tell me why did you need the test and how are your symptom, what are the medications. Uh, even if the task says very clearly, explain the results to the patient. They feel obliged that we, we want to spend five minutes, otherwise we'll not get the marks for the data gathering. Although they do not really understand what the task is saying. The task is very clear, so you guys need to focus on that. And then you need to listen to the uh, to the patient as well. The patient said, I don't have any problem uh, with the vision. So, so it means that we need to trust. And the patient said you everything very clearly. I'm not taking the medication. So you need to bring that uh, to the attention of the patient by explaining why you should control the medication, uh, control the diabetes, and what are the options that we can go for if one of them is not uh, suitable for you. You need to create that insight to the patient that um, you do not want to reach to the stage where uh, you, you get the complications. And this is only one complication that you could see, but there are many other complications from the uncontrolled diabetes that can happen and it may not be very obvious, like it can affect the kidneys and the heart and the brain. Uh, okay, so you need to highlight those and you need to save that time. The time that you're spending on just taking unnecessary history where the patient has come to you with the clear concerns and uh, you, you need to teach them. And this is your responsibility to educate the patient. As uh, uh, Dr. Kamran, uh, he is a consultant. He does not have the time to uh, do all those uh, uh, consultations unnecessarily and these are why uh, this is why there are so many leaflets because these are the generic information so that you can provide you can provide them the support and do for the investigations refer the patient to the relevant specialties so focus on that uh, understand your task and try to spend the time on that instead of uh, just asking history for every single thing, even if it is a results explanation, even if it is uh, explain the condition to the patient. Okay, you need to understand that data gathering is not what you are doing. Yeah, data gathering doesn't mean history taking. Please remember that. No, no okay. this is a, this yeah. is a confusion. Every yeah. single candidate, they, they come and start taking the history and they, they feel that uh, this is a data gathering. Guys, your data gathering starts from the very first second when you see the scenario outside, okay? What is the age of the patient? What is your setting? Why the patient has come to you? Okay, who has referred the patient? What is the gender of the patient? Okay, what is the background information if there's anything? So that is a data gathering. If you go blindly inside, say for example, outside it says there is a problem with the vision, and you go inside and you say, how can I help you? Your examiner will clearly understand that this guy did not read the scenario. He doesn't know that the patient has come with the problem with the vision and you are asking, you're wasting the time. Okay, just be clear, just be specific on, according to the task of your scenario, please. Thank you. Thank you, Rashid. Okay, so someone has asked me a question. How do we differentiate acne from mast cell activation of another issue as unresolved temporomandibular joint dysfunction? Oh, my God. No, well, I, I think you are uh, playing in the wrong court. No, 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 this is this is not for you. This is not for uh, someone appearing for PLAP2. Uh, this is not for me <laughs> either. Please, please, please don't make things complicated for you. Please. Uh, don't ask these sort of questions. If you are asking these sort of questions, it means that you are moving away from basics. Your job is uh, to, it, 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 you are working in a team and as a team player, your job is to educate the patient about the information provided to you. That's it. Sorry, uh, Samra, you have raised your hand. Please ask quickly. Yes, I just, uh, like you pointed out very correctly about this. So this, so in uh, in a nutshell, this case is just the patient has a vision problem. The long uh, he's not able to see in the long distance because of the presbyopia because of the age. Correct. That's correct. That's right. So in the management, so this management is mainly based upon his uh, making some lifestyle changes and educating him about his diet and his lifestyle. And he'll refer him to the specialist with regards to his diet, diabetic retinopathy. He'll the specialist will take care of it. Absolutely. So we do. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, and so we have my main concern, again, my main concern was that 
I mean, the, the reason for my concern was that I, I know myself that I'm not taking medications for diabetes. And why is that? Because I'm getting headaches because of the medications. So mm -hmm. you should spend some time on that aspect as well. Hmm. Okay. So you need to give me some sort of alternative medication so that I don't get headache. Okay. Okay. So just one question. If my if a patient says that I don't remember the name of the medication, doctor, but it used to give me headache. So how how do I like how will I know which medication is it and how? That's will I fine. Uh, you you have a patient's record. You are in a GP setting. GP they have access to everything. Okay. Hmm. You will tell the patient. Okay. Don't worry about that. You don't uh, remember the name of the medication. No problem. I will check that and we will provide you some alternative. Okay. okay. But the important okay. point is that. Your blood pressure needs to be, so, so your blood sugar needs to be very well controlled. This is the most important aspect of the management. Okay. How are we going to do that? We will provide you some alternative medication. That is not a problem, but you have to do something at your end. You have to take the medication regularly. But in addition to that, you need to do regular exercise. You need to eat healthy. You need to control your blood uh, pressure as well. Because if you don't control your blood pressure, then the, your diabetic retinopathy will accelerate. If you don't control your uh, cholesterol, your diabetic retinopathy will accelerate. All right? If you don't quit smoking, your diabetic retinopathy will accelerate. All right? So this sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, now, uh, so uh, Aruj Anthony, you have asked, uh, sir, new cases, please. Epicycleritis, cycleritis, toxoplasmosis. Aruj, is it possible for you to send me the scenarios? I won't be able to that, do that now because we are nearly concluding. Uh, I have to do some something else uh, important in five, 10 minutes. So I will arrange, I'm happy to arrange another session for those cases, but I need. Uh, yes, sir, uh, definitely. Uh, I will do you. Perfect. Uh, now, Hira, you said the cataract, ARMD. Uh, sorry, Clara said ARMD. What does that mean? I, I don't know. Uh, we have discussed about AMD, we have discussed about cataract. Um, are you talking about the differentials of my symptoms? Uh, no, these are not differentials of my symptoms because I had problem with my near vision, not with my distance vision. Kindly discuss some PEDS related eye scenarios. Like what? Can you name any of the, that, please? So that I, I, I can, I'm, I'm happy to do, uh, run another scenario with you, uh, sorry, another session with you guys. Uh, if you can give me a list of PEDS related eye scenarios coming in lab two exam uh it says newest cases i don't know just uh, before the cases can vision therapy recommendation vision therapy recommendation uh, i don't know what does that mean vision therapy recommendations alongside uh, other intervention help with the visual neuropathy linked to muscular sclerosis muscular sclerosis what is muscular sclerosis sorry multiple sclerosis you mean um okay well, uh, as I said, multiple sclerosis, uh, okay. Multiple sclerosis, I don't know multiple sclerosis. I don't deal with multiple sclerosis. I deal with optic neuritis, okay? Which is entirely different from multiple sclerosis. Optic neuritis has got many causes. Multiple sclerosis is one of them. Yes, in most cases, optic neuritis will have underlying multiple sclerosis. Now, optic neuritis in 90... 5% cases is self-resolving condition. You don't need any treatment for uh, optic neuritis. In 5% cases, you may need treatment in the form uh, of steroids. I'm steroid. sorry, uh, Dr. Kamran, do we need to start the patient on steroids at all for the optic neuritis? No, that's what I'm, I'm saying. No, no that's treatment. I'm saying no. Hmm. Okay. No, you don't need to. Please don't give steroids that in the GP setting for optic neuritis. Yeah. Test. So this is one of the common mistakes. You are going to make mind. Trust me. The oral steroids are contraindicated in optic neuritis. Please remember that. Even hmm. if we have to give steroids, we will give uh, IV methylprednisolone for three days in high dose, hmm. and then we switch the patients on oral steroids after first three days, okay? Giving the patient oral steroids at presentation with optic neuritis can harm their vision in the longer run. There are many studies on that. Uh, okay, so all chronic blurry vision and problems seeing from far and near. 
Meanwhile, presbyopia and near vision only. Yes, presbyopia means problem with the near vision. It is not problem of the eyes. It is the problem of the muscles around the eyes due to increasing age. They are not able to focus. So that's why people are not able to see clearly at a near. And that's why they use glasses. Okay. Uh, to I agree with the comment to ocular cardiac reflex issue worth coming up during advice. Ocular cardiac reflex issues. Sorry, I, I didn't get that question. Um, ocular cardiac reflex issues. Uh, what has that to do uh, with the diabetic retinopathy? Sorry, I don't know. Instead of asking, how can I help you? What should we ask then? Please tell us. Instead of asking, how can I help you? Well, uh, the, I, I think this is a, a very nice way, really. Uh, I think this is what I will do, or, or this is what I do in my clinic, that you ask the patient that, okay, sir, how may I help you? That's it. Uh, there, there might be some other uh, better way, but um, uh, I think Rashid can comment on that. Uh, Samra, you have raised your hand. Just give me one minute. Let me go through the questions quickly. Uh, okay, I can see from the notes that you have a vision problem. Please tell me more about that. Okay, yeah, that, that can be another way uh, of approaching a patient. Uh, you're doing a great job, doctors. Thank you. Uh, is that for me? Uh, thank you very much. Um, please discuss toxoplasmosis. Yes, I will do that, but not today, unfortunately, because uh, it's already four o'clock. Uh, uh, I think there are a couple of other scenarios from the list. Those need to be discussed with you guys. And uh, you have uh, uh, left some messages uh, about epicycleritis, cycleritis, and toxoplasmosis. I'm happy to do, run another session with you guys. If you can please provide me the scenarios, the actual scenarios, so that I understand what we are dealing with rather than giving you unnecessary information. Uh, cases like fundo findings uh, in Nyman Pick disease, retinopathy of prematurity. Oh my God. Uh, did they ask about retinopathy of prematurity? Or uh, you said torch infection. Did they ask about torch infection? Increased ICP. I have already discussed idiopathic intracranial hypertension with you guys. So that covers it. But I'm very interested to know if they ever asked about uh, retinopathy of prematurity or a torch infection affecting the eyes. Can we give steroids in giant cell arthritis? Well, unfortunately, uh, I did not have time to discuss about giant cell arthritis, though it was on my list uh, today. So I'm going to do another session with you guys very, very soon. Um, okay, we will wait for your next class. Well done. Thank you very much. Okay, so just a few things before we conclude. Uh, first of all, uh, many thanks for uh, providing me this opportunity uh, for to run this session. I, as I said, I understand that it's uh, Ramadan and uh, you might be fasting uh, back home. It was iftar time. Uh, but you 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 still uh, spent uh, three hours with me, guys. Uh, so with me. So thank you very much for that. So as I said uh, uh, earlier, that I would like to thank uh, Plab Guide Academy for providing me uh, the support uh, to run this session, uh, and I will uh, encourage uh, you guys who have not attended any academy yet to please consider enrolling uh, in Plab Guide Academy. It is one of the uh, best uh, academies around for PLAB2. Um, I'm uh, linked with the uh, doctor's lodges. I'm director of uh, that organization and we provide accommodation to PLAB2 candidates in Manchester. So in case you are looking for accommodation, don't forget me, <laughs> all right? And uh, we also provide uh, uh, homemade halal food, uh, food to our candidates. Uh, under the banner of uh, uh, lab, uh, sorry, uh, doctor's kitchen. So don't forget about that. So I hope to see you guys soon. And please don't forget uh, to share uh, the list of the scenarios. Those were not covered today so that I can go through those and I can arrange another session with you guys very, very soon.
Please share details of lodges too. Yes, we will. And halal food. Thank you very much. Okay, enjoy the rest of the day. I have a question. Um, okay, before we start the questions, uh, I want to say uh, thanks a lot to uh, Dr. Kamran. First of all, I can see Zishan, uh, Zishan Umad, uh, one of my fellow that I met in Karachi. Hello, Zishan. So, Dr. Kamran, uh, extremely thankful. Uh, that you you arranged, uh, you happy to spare the time. It was really precious, very, very important information that I got uh, from you. And uh, I really appreciate uh, your time and effort that you made. Um, now I can just leave this in your hand. Guys, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Please uh, also similarly, do not forget to... Um, uh, to contact us if you have any question. Um, we are starting our campus in Lahore as well uh, from May, inshallah. Okay, uh, the course will start in May. We have already uh, acquired the place and we are trying to move our material, the mannequins and everything there. So feel free to contact us in that regard as well. If you need yes, any hello, sessions, yeah. Yeah, I just, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just had a question with Bila Blepharitis. Uh, Dr. Kamran said that it's associated with skin conditions like eczema and acne vulgaris. So if the patient comes with these associated skin uh, conditions, Dr. Kamran told that we have to treat the blepharitis and the skin condition. So how will we treat the skin conditions, doctor? So you do not need to necessarily treat it yourself. You can refer the patient to the dermatologist. Okay, so that it's that simple. We can just say we'll refer you to the skin specialist. Yeah, for yes, the... it is very simple. Yes, it is very simple. Um, so you you stay in your own domain. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so you, you involve the relevant specialty instead of um, doing whatever you, you think you may need to do. Okay, it does not mean that you have to do it. Uh, you can get the right help for the right patient. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, guys, any question, anything that you want to say? Um, and diabetic retinopathy, do we have to inform the DVLA? No, no. Okay. Yeah, as long as a patient can see safely, uh, you do not have to inform, um, involve the DVLA. Yes, Mariam? I do have a question regarding the toxoplasmosis case. I was doing a case yesterday. She's an old lady. She has a PMR and she's on steroid. The only yeah. case that she came with was blur, um, uh, blurry vision, and uh, which was acute three weeks ago. And like I was taking the history, she doesn't have anything. So in their case, like there is answer. She lives with six cats. So if I jump and ask like um, about cats, doesn't that sound like scripted? Because she didn't have anything. Uh -huh. Ruling out everything just in the first two minutes. Um, so, sorry, I didn't get your question right uh, fully. So my question is, I uh, immediately you would know that this person doesn't have like uh, diabetic retinopathy, cataract, age-related macular degeneration because it's an, an acute setting. And mm. I ruled out in uh, glaucoma, she doesn't have nausea and vomit and headache. So the, mm. the thing that's going to come in my head is toxoplasmosis since we're doing PLAP and we know these cases. How not yeah. to sound scripted? Because like she lives uh, with cats. Do I ask like after that, do you live with cats? And like, it's a bit like confusing. Uh, <clears throat> no, so um, how will your examiner know what you are ruling out, okay? So it is not necessarily that you ask so many questions about every single individual uh, diagnosis of the differential that you have, okay? So you want to ask as many questions as you, uh, you can to support your diagnosis and as many questions 
as you can to negate or rule out any other differentials, okay? So I do not think that asking about the cat, about any, any pets or any injury to the hand or any scratch will be, uh, will make you sound scripted, okay? But at the same time, you want to be safe. If you start by asking the questions about uh, about the problem, about the symptoms, uh, which are related to the to the toxoplasmosis, and sorry, uh, then, sorry? I, I just want to add one more point. Mm -hmm. This kit is going to be a combined station where fundoscope is going to be a necessary uh, test and, and done. So it's going to be two minutes only for me to take history, three minutes of me doing the examination and three minutes of managing the person. So mm -hmm. how can I roll out all of these diseases and ask targeted questions about toxoplasmosis and not sound scripted at the same time? It now, who said you? Who said you to make the diagnosis or that you have to reach final diagnosis? It is not important, okay? Uh, you know how much you can ask. My suggestion in, in the combined station is always to uh, just to focus uh, um, to the presenting complaint and explore that, okay? Onset, duration, progression, aggravating factor, relieving factor, and anything else that you want to know. Okay, just a few things. And then you simply move to the examination. You cannot do that, okay? Towards the end, you can explain to the patient that uh, my my feeling is that uh, it may be toxoplasmosis or it may be glaucoma. Uh, however, we need to, I will need to ask you a few more questions, okay? Uh, this is more about the HOPI, just a history of the presenting illness. Since when you start feeling the symptoms, any other symptoms associated with that, uh, is it all the time, is it coming or going, uh, coming and going, or uh, is it constant, anything that makes it better, anything that makes, makes it worse? Okay, now let me quickly examine you and see behind your eyes. All right, so this is all what you need to do in the combined station. And in combined station, you do not have a lot of time to, to waste in asking so many questions. Uh, there are four marks for data gathering, technical and assessment skills, okay? Which means that there will be only one or two marks maximum for, uh, for the history taking. So you cannot waste a lot of time in that, okay? Just, ask any single um, combined station, what I teach, what we teach in the academy is two minutes, four minutes, and two minutes, okay? <clears throat> Initial two minutes, building your rapport, greeting the patient, building the rapport, then taking the history, then explaining the procedure about, um, about what you want to do, okay? Telling about the exposure, uh, about the position, gaining any consent if needed, okay? So you need, you have only maximum two minutes for that. You need four minutes for um, for a clinical examination or for a procedure. And as soon as you hear the two minutes warning, you need to go back to the to the patient and start talking about the management. So yeah. I will just simply stick to the presenting complaint without ruling out any major pathologies, okay, or without asking any. Um, any unnecessary like travel history, what do you do for living as long as um, it is not linked, okay? If the patient comes with something which is linked to the profession, then only I will ask about, about the profession. Thank okay, you. guys. Um, thank you. Uh, Mariam, uh, I hope that uh, you got the answer. Yes, very clear. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Um, Hope to see you again. Uh, we'll continue our activities a bit more um, after the Eid. And um, every Tuesday, uh, we are making a few changes and we, we, you can see, uh, you will be able to see our um, weekly rota of the free sessions as well. Uh, they will happen on Tuesdays. If there's anything, it will be advertised on the website, okay? So see you all. Best of luck and uh, stay connected, guys. Thank you.